My name is Meya Meyapan. Uh, I'm from NASA Ames Research Center in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, California. Uh, there, in the last you know 20 years, I've been focusing on uh, nanotechnology. Um, uh, I, I have run a center for nanotechnology uh, at NASA Ames in the last you know 20 years. Uh, our focus has been looking at nanomaterials for a variety of aerospace uh, applications um, in terms of electronics, sensors, uh, instrumentation, uh, energy uh, generation uh, and, and storage. So these are all the applications that we have looked at uh, in the last 20 years. I studied uh, chemical engineering um, as an undergraduate and also uh, for my PhD. Uh, for my PhD the focus was more on material science and right after I got my PhD um, I started um, uh, working on um, electronic devices. Uh, interestingly my focus in the beginning uh, of my career was semiconductor devices. So all of a sudden, I really had to learn uh, device physics, you know, which was not a uh, subject uh, that was taught in any chemical engineering curriculum. Uh, so it was almost like getting a, a second PhD in electrical engineering or electronics engineering for me. Uh, but it, it, it turned out to be a, a good thing because now, I had a, a you know, broader perspective, um, uh, an education in uh, chemical engineering and, uh, and application oriented um, uh, in a career start uh, in uh, semiconductor device physics and device you know, design. So that was the start of my career and uh, um, my first part of the uh, working career was uh, in a company where all my focus was in you know, semiconductor devices. Then later on, I you know, joined NASA, where I had the opportunity to start working on uh, nanotechnology. And uh, uh, all my NASA career, uh, the focus uh, you know, has been on nanotechnology. The projects we are working on right now uh, include a developing uh, uh, gas sensors and biosensors uh, those two uh, you know using nanomaterials like you know carbon nanotubes uh, that is a primary focus um, we are also working on um, uh, flexible electronics uh, particularly uh, trying to make uh, devices and sensors on substrates such as you know, cotton in you know, a textile and then paper uh, as a substrate. So this is you know flexible electronics because there are certain advantages you know these could be you know cheaper to make compared to using you know silicon substrate and clean room fabrication. Um, so these the applications include things like smart textile and smart paper. Um, we are also looking at some radical technologies like making, uh, you know, vacuum tubes nanoscale uh, because the advantages include, um, you know, a, a, va a vacuum uh, uh, is the fastest medium for electron transport, okay, okay. because uh, electron transport in semiconductors, uh, the electrons can scatter, um, so they slow down, whereas in vacuum they can just, you know, um, you know just go through ballistically. Um, the other major advantage is, um, you know, vacuum tubes or vacuum devices, uh, they are immune to radiation. So, so we are looking at, uh, you know, novel uh, electronics, uh, basically trying to bring back, you know, vacuum tubes, but nanoscale. So these are some of the things that, um, we are currently working on. Certainly it's an exciting uh, field. Uh, the potential of nanotechnology to impact 
pretty much all the economic sectors it, it is you know tremendous uh, so those possibilities you know make your professional life you know interesting and exciting so so you really get up excited about you know doing something um, you know new uh, day in and day out so so that that's a driving force okay there's never a dull moment the impact of nanotechnology on day to day life today okay it is not large um, because the field started you know just about approximately about a decade ago uh, the funding for the field earnestly started you know in the early 2000 so typically it takes a couple of decades uh, by the time you start making you know fundamental discoveries and the time it takes to translate that into a tangible product uh, which you can uh, you know buy in the market it typically takes a couple of decades you know the re that has been a historical fact regardless of you know what the technology was you know that was true of all the semiconductor um, and integrated circuit technologies and micro electromechanical systems other micro uh, uh, systems uh, every technology it, it takes that much time uh, because you have to be able to manufacture them in a large scale uh, you got to bring the price down you know to a level that it is affordable then you have to think about reliability you have to do quality control you got to worry about robustness and of course you know depending on the application you, you got to pay attention to safety nanomaterials have you know safety related you know concerns uh, so there are a lot of issues that um, uh, that need to be solved before you can go to the store and buy something okay so that's why this you know the two decade um, uh, the time period and uh, uh, so hopefully we will start seeing uh, a lot of nano base you know applications in day-to-day -day life you know probably uh, you know within the next decade uh, particularly uh, a pervasive use of you know solid state lighting okay um, for example, the ordinary light bulbs, we throw away most of the uh, energy input as waste heat. Okay? So the solid state lighting uh, is supposed to be a good alternative, uh, but the price is still very high. Okay? Um, so people are looking at ways to, uh, uh, to have high efficiency uh, of the solid state lighting uh, while bringing the price down to an affordable level. So that, you know, that is uh, that and, um, you know, memory devices and uh, better batteries and, um, you know, super capacitors with very high power density, um, early warning, uh, you know, diagnostics, you know, for healthcare, um, you know, gas or vapor sensors, which could be in your smartphone. Um, so that way when you go jogging, um, you know, you will have an idea whether there is a lot of pollution out there or not. Um, you know, monitoring indoor air quality, you know, for gas and vapor sensors. So th there, are, there are a lot of, you know, things that are in the works and uh, hopefully they should come to the marketplace you know, in the next few years. Well, uh, in the next 10 years, um, uh, you know, one of the big things that is uh, yeah, happening uh, in the U.S. is um, uh, the use of, um, you know, private sector, you know, for, for you know, for launching, um, you know, rockets. And um, uh, essentially, after the space shuttle is gone, uh, now the job is done by, um, you know, private sector which I think in my opinion uh, is the right thing to do uh, because in many ways um, going back and forth to the space station you know delivering uh, goods okay it is uh, more or less the job of uh, like uh, UPS or uh, in a DHL okay and um, uh, when it is done routinely and they 
and when you get to the level at some point if you're going to be doing this every other week okay uh, you know why should the government be involved in an operation which is more or less like UPS or DHL or FedEx right so uh, a private sector equivalent to those you know FedEx type operation you know could be done uh, you know, by, by company, which is now being done by companies like you know SpaceX, so that that will, you know, that will be in full force, you know, in the next you know decade. So that allows agencies like NASA and ESA and JAXA and others uh, to look at you know planetary exploration, uh, obviously mostly unmanned and you know perhaps you know some manned exploration to you know Mars and. Uh, you know that topic has been you know heating up and it looks like you know the private sector participation and that also could go up okay so these are some of the exciting you know things uh, that could happen in the next decade in space applications uh, the potential for nanotechnology is really uh, huge. Um, uh, imagine planetary exploration and you want to know what the uh, atmospheric composition uh, in a given planet and how it varies over a large area. Uh, then you can have really tiny sensors, maybe a thousand of them spread over a very large area and um, uh, in the form of a sensor network so you can develop a planetary atmosphere yeah, a map and uh, so those tiny sensors which uh, are powerful and very sensitive and uh, they can monitor many different gases and vapors but they consume very low power okay so that that's a great potential these kind of gas and vapor sensors you know could be used to monitor uh, you know leak um, fuel leak uh, in the space vehicle um, we also don't routinely uh, monitor uh, the radiation levels in the spacecraft or um, any kind of you know space habitat uh, because the typical radiation monitoring uh, devices are bulk equipment but you can again make uh, you know tiny radiation monitoring you know sensors that can give you uh, you know what the local radiation level is you know what are the different types of radiations uh, and what their energy levels are so so those are all possibilities uh, and also you know the spacecraft itself uh, you know for logistical reasons um, you know, it must be as um, uh, uh, you know, light as possible. There are, there are nanomaterials that are, such as carbon nanotubes and graphene, you know, being used to uh, develop you know, composites, which have very high strength and low weight. So you can use these materials uh, to construct the spacecraft itself, you know, cryogenic tanks. Um, so these are all uh, uh, potential applications for nanotechnology that will make in a space, a space exploration um, essentially, uh, hopefully, you know, cheaper. Um, because the main thrust, uh, you know, the, the, particularly when it comes to engineers, what they have to accomplish uh, in space exploration is, is miniaturization of the payload, okay? Uh, because the logistical cost of lifting everything is, is very high. And uh, so that's the reason, that's the driving force behind the attempts to miniaturize everything, a, a, a payload, whether it is a communication or whether it is a scientific instrument, we want to make them smaller, we want to make them um, run, um, you know, low power consumption. Uh, so those are the goals, you know, nanotechnology can help you with those goals, you know, trying to miniaturize your payload and uh, trying to make them very energy efficient, so low power consumption. So those are all the potential you know, possibilities as we advance uh, nanoscience and nanomaterials and nanotechnology. You know, the concern I have, you know, which is a societal concern, is that 
uh, in the last decade or two that we have come up with a variety of nanomaterials, you know, some of the top ones being you know, carbon nanotubes and um, you know, all kinds of nanoparticles. Um, you know, these are so small that um, you know, when we produce them and when we use them in applications, uh, you know, there is a possibility to inhale them. And we have no idea uh, what kind of adverse effects that uh, these materials um, can have on the on our uh, you know, health, um, the impact on the environment, uh, the impact on our uh, water sources and food sources. You know, we don't know uh, completely. Um, so. Um, you know, the research community across the world, you know, in U.S., in Japan, and in, uh, in the European Union, uh, uh, they have started investigating uh, the impact of nanomaterials on health and environment and, uh, you know, the safety concerns. Uh, so that effort has to go up, and we really have to clearly map out um, everything, okay? So we want to know everything. Uh, before we have a you know, wide range of our big scale uh, applications. So you know, that because it is important, otherwise that could become a showstopper. Um, so that, that, is, that is a concern out there, uh, but it should be addressed um, you know, properly. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, you, you have to be optimistic. Uh, if you're not, you won't even feel like getting up in the morning and are uh, going to work, so you have to be optimistic. And, um, but by nature, you know, people who are involved in these kind of activities, you know, they tend to be optimistic. And uh, uh, you know, if you don't have that outlook, um, I think you would be better off you know, doing something else. And, um, so, so naturally, you know, I'm, you know, I'm with the right, you know, group of people, you know, working on good things. That is easier today than ever uh, because of, uh, you know, the internet and um, the amount of material that is available, um, you know, for anyone to learn about anything because everything that you need is pretty much um, available on your you know, fingertip and so using all these resources uh, you know, wisely uh, and learning about um, you know things that, you know, that is important um, you know one of the common problems um, across the globe uh, you know, particularly in, in developed countries on both sides of the Atlantic uh, is the a number of young people, you know, going into the so-called STEM fields, you know, science and engineering fields, you know, has been going down. Uh, and I hope that gets in a reverse. And um, uh, hopefully the availability of the, uh, the large amount of information you know, through this you know, new medium of you know, internet, um, that should be able to uh, help in, in reversing the tide, in making people, um, you know, making young people, um, you know, go back to the STEM fields, because that is important, you know, for our economies to, to keep going and, and thriving. Um, so that is one thing I, you know, hope for. Um, advising young people if you're passionate about this, you know, work hard and, um, you know, pick whatever engineering uh, or science, you know, physics, chemistry, biology, or any type of uh, engineering and, uh, you know, there are endless opportunities, you know, to pursue, you know, careers. So, you know, that's my message to young people.